interview the expert session. And so I'm happy to say that our good friend Bob Rudis from Rapid7 is back uh, for our, our second event. And so uh, Bob is the chief security data scientist at Rapid7. Um, got a lot of experience in this space. Uh, formerly used to be on leading the, the Verizon Data Breach uh, Report uh, team as well. And so, um, again, we're real pleased to have Bob back. And of course, uh, Ellie, our, our symposium moderator, is going to be interviewing him, asking some questions. And please make this an open dialogue and ask questions as we go along. So, without further ado, the Ellie and Bob show. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, and I think we'll get started. Actually, kind of. Um, can you guys? Can you guys hear just fine? Okay, back there. Can we hear okay? I think mine's, cool. on, right. mine's on too. Uh, I want to get started actually kind of following along the previous discussion. We were just having a chat over here about uh, DevOps. So, you know, in all the stuff you do, you do a Rapid7, I mean, taking advantage of all the DevOps advantages and, you know, not even rolling your own hardware, but as much as you can, taking advantage of stuff that's out there. Is that something you guys have as well? Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, when Rapid7, like I wasn't around for the initial, you know, inception of Rapid7, but uh, I've been there for almost going on three years now. and. One thing that was amazing to me going into it was pretty much everybody is doing work in the cloud. Like we're trying to push everyone like every other vendor is because we don't want to ship kit. We don't want to have appliances, blah, blah, blah. We're, we're pushing everyone into the cloud. So pretty much every single thing we do is related to at scale cloud deployments for all of our stuff. Yeah, and it's, and you can say, it, it probably saves you guys a ridiculous amount of time. Uh, it, it saves us. It saves us a lot of time, and it and it makes Jeff Bezos the richest man in the world. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, yeah. But, I mean, speaking from my own small experience, we had a small startup, and having a cloud-based, you know, customers can use it easier. Yeah. And can roll it out easier, saving all that support. Um, so moving moving on into the stuff that you're doing. Um, so you you know, Rapid Seven is is a cybersecurity company. Um, and you're constantly at the, you talk to you're constantly on Twitter talking about new phones you're finding. Um, and all that stuff, but I know you use an awful lot of data science to do that. So can you talk a little bit about how data science plays a role in finding the bones that you guys identify? Sure. And actually, can I just have a show of hands of who knows what Rapid7 is? I'm not going to, okay, that, that's enough that I'm not going to talk about what we do. Uh, you can hit me up afterwards if you want to know. Um, and just the side note is I work on the research team at Rapid7, so I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a product dev guy. Uh, I, t I tend to look at internet scale things, reverse is not. And that's that's actually one one of the things that that, that uh, sees me do all the time is I'm usually telling you how bad the world is every day. If you follow me on Twitter, you're going to find out just how bad things are every single day. Um, and it's not because like I like depressing. Well, I do like depressing people, but it's not like I like depressing people. It's it's that's just what it is. And if we don't talk about what's bad, and it, there was like a following that amazing talk is actually is because I'm like yes, yes, yes to that whole talk internally. Um, you know, so what we try to do is gain a handle on what exposure looks like. On a minute by minute, hour by hour, whatever, whatever basis, we we do we try to do a lot of forecasting. Uh, we try to do a lot of attacker modeling on the at scale honeypot data that we have, and then we also have the uh, the flip side of it. So we have a ton of honeypots all over the internet, maybe between 150 and 200 any given day. What we've got spun up, uh, we scan the internet for all sorts of things all the time. Probably we probably from at least three of you, I've probably gotten a cease and desist notice, you know, from from the abuse list. And um, well, that that's a huge thing. It's amazing. It's amazing what some companies think security is, and um, the because uh, like stopping uh, stopping me port scanning you is really not going to make you much safe. The um, and so what we do is we try to apply a lot of like forecasting type data science to the trending component of that. We try to apply like other types of things like Markov chains and things like that to understand attacker behaviors and what they're doing on there and see what they're modeling and see see what's new and what's different. And that's just on like the research at scale exposure side of things. Uh, we also try to add extra stuff into there to quantify it at like nation level and actually lately, more lately, country and industry level too. We're actually like layering some of that data in. Um, but on the flip side, in our product line, um, there's a lot of what I call like human driven heuristics. So basically old, old school programming and old school hand coded decision trees. Um, and then, you know, for the past couple of years, there's been an interjection of machine learning and other advancements into there so that the computer is taking on more of the role of you know, machine learning algorithms, taking some of the role of actually creating those automated decision trees and doing some of that. I, I, I like the, the human algorithms are still pretty darn good, by the way, but like we, we do also need a balance of actually adding some things so that we can look at what's actually happening in places, develop algorithms, take a look at that, create ways of fine tuning those things and getting feedback feedback from this within the, the, the industry to get to the fact that the customers do things. So, so to, to pick on one of those, you, when you're doing a port scan and you're yeah. getting back enormous amounts of data, you know, what, how, how would you actually use that to, to find something that's going on wrong or to find a new kind of attack that's, that's taking place? 
Wow. So, I mean, I guess the so port scan data, it's a, so you just gave me a broad topic to talk about. Um, and, by, and when I say that is like, so we were, so we're not Google, like we don't try to grab like billions and billions of web pages. Uh, we try to work at the infrastructure level. So we grab things at like an IP address level. Uh, so we just to give you for the folks that don't know some of the scanning stuff that we do. And I'm going to, I'm going to plug open data.rapid7.com right now. So if you've got a digital device and you don't want to hear me talk, you can at least go to open data, sign up for an account. We give data away for free. Uh, there's a couple questions you have to ask, and we give you like gig, like gigab terabytes, pet, half petabytes of data you want for free for this stuff. Uh, we scan the internet every like every every day for all sorts of things. We grab web pages, we grab banners from all sorts of types of services like mail and telnet and SSH and things like that. Uh, we grab SSL certificate information. Uh, we look up DNS domain names and store the results of those things so people can analyze that and, and see what's happening out there. Uh, which one of those do you want me to tell you what we just do, just do, do cert, you're talking about certs for a little while. You, you've got SSL certs. Uh, yeah, so like for on, 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 the, on the certificate level, um, depending on what we want to study at any given moment in time, because we're not studying all these things at any given moment in time, uh, one area of research for certificates is trying to take a look at what folks are doing to emulate real certificates, but not actually be a real certificate, but be good enough to fake what's happening with, with that out there. So there's a lot of closeness things that you can do on there, basically pull out features from the certificate, you know, build it into a classification or recognition algorithm, and then use that to apply for other things out there to see if you can figure out, like, maybe a spammer is trying to clone a particular certificate from a, another site, or trying to maybe take it from a, an actual organization to trick users into using them versus not. Um, I, as a side note, I, I also use that data like to do my monthly rant against Let's Encrypt because I kind of hate that service, and um, because they really enabled phishing like better than anyone ever has in the history of computers. So like there's like there's there's non like I me mean, that's data science because it's counting, but because and actually what I usually tell my kids when they ask me what I do for a living is I count IP addresses because I actually really do count IP addresses for a living. That's interesting because it's the same thing as you were saying before. You know, that Let's Encrypt on the one hand it lets anyone get get an SSL cert, which can be positive, but yeah. the bad guys can sort of take that up as well. So kind of just following up on that, and I mean, we can try to figure out how to, how to play with this. You know, if, what, what would be, you know, let's say you, you find some, some new attack that's going on. Uh, you can take SSL script, SSL certs or any other thing which, which you guys have. What would be your ideal response from a community? You know, so you, you, you say, Here, here's a new attack coming in, and here's something which we're starting to see an awful lot of. People, I'm telling you about this. You know, how, how do you want folks to be responding to that? Actually, yeah, I mean, I can give you one older example that had concrete evidence, like we can actually show you the evidence before and after. Um, and I can give you one more recent one that I can tell you the after in you know, like three weeks when I when I do a scan. Um, so like one's from a couple years ago. It was right after that fateful day in November, and uh, a bunch of radio stuff, a bunch of um, like malicious hackers were taking over radio stations, playing F a certain person uh, music on there, and they were doing it through an, an IP based interface to play play radio stuff over trend for transmitters. A lot of people don't realize that radio stations don't sit where their transmitters are pretty much anymore. They have an internet link to those transmitters, and it's usually over an IP, you know, normal IP based things, and generally it's not secured well because it's humans. And um, they were taking over those things, and we managed to work with the National Association of Broadcasters, and they had an incredible response. So we found, and my, the end's not in my head, I didn't actually pair it. So there, there and you can, there, I did a blog about the end. So there's a, there, we found and I think it was like in the thousands and thousands of these things. So imagine taking over that and repurposing it and putting out a really negative or really bad or really scary emergency broadcast signal instead of just playing negative music about the president. And, because um, that, that could be horrible. So that's why we kind of jumped on it, because we, we, we tried to see what, what could be possible we did that. And they, they cleaned it up in two days. Um, they, we, we saw a 50% reduction within two days of us working with the National, Associ National Association of Broadcasters on that. Um, and it almost went down to zero um, after that. So it just there was a little longer tail on that as more people were coming back to work and doing stuff to be able to do that. But a more recent one is, has anyone heard of the, the Microtik worm that was going out in the past maybe a month or so, well, uh, real brief on this one, and actually the, this, this has been a theme for the year. Uh, attackers, it was just mentioned, attackers love mining cryptocurrency. Um, if, if, you, if you aren't monitoring your infrastructure for increased electricity usage, you probably should because they're probably in there, they're probably mining stuff, and you're probably, having, you're probably you know, supporting other hackers. And, um, they, they, and I, the attackers have also gotten super clever. Like, 
for the past five years, I've been really depressed because the hacks have sucked. They've been the same old, same old up until last year. Like, no, it gets really boring after all because attackers, please just change it up a little bit so that people have to work for a living. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, I, I know it sounds funny and I, it's not that I like appreciate the hackers, but I would just like it to not be the same old, same old because we've been saying the same thing for 20 years. No one listens and the attack hackers just do it. So, um, the, they've migrated into, you know, let's get crypto miners everywhere. Like, that's actually one big lucrative thing that they're doing. And uh, they came up with, and I, you'll hear me say nice things about attackers a lot, and it's not that I really think they're nice, I just, it's really cool. They had this super clever idea of uh, using a recent vulnerability in MicroTik routers. They're really popular routers all over the world. I've got visualizations that galore on my website and my, my work website if you want to see them. Um, and they didn't take over the device to have the device mine cryptocurrency. They took over the device because traffic passes through these devices and people's web pages pass through these devices. And they injected crypto miners into every web page that was behind or in front of that, that, that particular router. So you, you, if you're behind the router as a user, you visit a web page, you get a crypto miner on a JavaScript, a JavaScript crypto miner in your browser. They took over 300,000 of these devices and millions of pages as a result were in it inadvertently serving up crypt uh, cryptocurrency miners. Um, the vast majority of them, unfortunately, were in Brazil. Um, that just, it's a thing about the way people maintain infrastructure in various places. And uh, so we actually worked with CERT VR um, and they are, they've been in the process for a couple weeks now working with all the ISPs down there to clean up those things. Uh, so us being able to detect that these things are actually out there at scale, you know, use the data to figure out what's actually where, validate that there actually is a problem, and then being able to hone it down to where the actual issues are and, got, and you know, get in contact with uh, some authorities, like that's actually one of the coolest things. It doesn't happen as much as I'd like, but when it does happen, it's, it's awesome because we, we, we make things better. Yeah, and I, I imagine kind of to your point, you know, we, we've been trying to get out there, here are certain vulns, and you guys, you, you just got to patch it. And after a while, you're right, it gets, it gets a little pressing. I know that uh, I, should, I should definitely put in the plug uh, cert has an entire division that's dedicated towards vulnerability coordination. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, please check out the CERT website. Uh, it's, it's an important issue, as, as, uh, as we can attest to here. Uh, let's take a little bit of a shift here. I know that you've been incredibly involved in the R community. Yes. Um, and just basically, rather than anything, what to do with it, but just hear our analytics and how to use them. Can you comment on like, kind of what you've been doing there and a little bit about how that affects what you're doing now? Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm a huge R um, aficionado. Um, I call myself an R avuncular, and people who watch Pro know what that word means. Um, and like, it's not that I think R is like the bestest, bestest language, that'd be small talk. Um, but the, like the actual small talk language. Um, but R is probably sec second to small talk on that one, and every single other one is completely, totally inferior. We can have that debate after this if you want. Um, but I, I like R because of its expressiveness, ex expressiveness because you can, it's got a core uh, history in statistics and then you know, also machine learning because that's just part of the fancy, the fancy word for statistics. Um, but it also has amazing visualization capabilities as well too. And it's also got probably the world's best, I think, community. And like I know all the gophers would tell me that I'm wrong. I know all the, 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 the Rust Strike Force would probably tell me that I'm wrong. I mean, I, mean, I know we've all got our own little communities of these things, but I just find the language super easy to use. It's built for extensibility, so it, it actually can use every other language out there. So like I've written R packages that are backed by Python, that are backed by Java, that are backed by Scala, that are, I mean, that are backed by C++. I mean, basically, it's a great connector language and putting things together. So. Um, I think it didn't get its due earlier just because it was so niche and focused on statistics that now that it's kind of broader out there and there's a lot of tools and there's a lot of community, I think we're seeing a lot better out there. But it isn't the only tool I use. Like, I do use a ton of things. We actually talked about that when we were, when we were setting this up. And um, so while I love R, I think it's one of the best things. I push people towards using R versus other things, too. It's not the only language I think people need to use when they're doing data science. Well, so on that note, and I'm sure there's a couple of folks in here who do data science professionally. So, you know, what, what kind of what kind of data change? Yeah, I, I, all the Python that. people raise your hands, right? Because that's who you are, right? You do data science, right? <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, so I, I I will I will slum and use Python on occasion to do things. Um, I, I actually love Scala, um, surprisingly. Um, like, I think R and Scala make, make, make a great combination for things. Uh, and as, as a matter of fact, like, from, there's like a, the, the popularity contest amongst new things that happen in, in data science is actually at a pace that almost I can't keep up with it. But, you know, so you've got this new movement where we went from Hadoop to like Spark type things now. Um, and like Spark is just a wonderful environment for doing analytics at scale. And what, I, what, for the life of me, I don't understand why people choose to use something else besides Scala to write Spark jobs. 
To me, it just makes a lot more sense. It's a native thing. You're not actually adding more compute power to the actual systems to do the work. Um, so like you've got things like Solid that are actually out there to do that as well too. But you know, there's a whole slew of things that have, to me, that go into doing data science. And the actual core thing you're doing for like programming and analysis is just one tiny part of that. Like I, I, I have more, like as he was saying, I have more pound bin bash scripts than I probably have R scripts, right? And I, I do work in Python because there's stuff in Python that isn't in R. There's a lot of stuff in R, the, in Python, a lot of stuff in R that's not in Python too. Like, so you need to have a balance of those things. So I think it's like finding the right tool for the right job is kind of what you actually need to do. And, and I think also if you're awesome at Python and doing data science in Python, for heaven's sakes, do data science in Python. I mean, it's a perfectly legitimate tool to do that stuff, and there's a ton of resources for it, and you can do a great job. So for me, um, you know, I, I even encourage people like that aren't doing cyber stuff necessarily that if you're if you're comfortable in Excel, do data. I mean, I, if, if they don't want to program more, do what you can in the thing that you can do the best, and get really really good at it, so you can solve the whole point is to solve problems, not to become you know a priest of a language and kind of you know try, you know, try to make converts to the language. Oh so, yeah, it's, I know we we do a lot of a lot of R and a lot of Python as well. Um, it's the right tool for the right job is definitely how it comes down for us. Um, one of the things which we mentioned we were talking about set, setting this up is that you've been involved um, not necessarily in the data science itself but in all the privacy stuff related to it and particularly with GDPR and the regulatory role that's coming. Can you just talk a little about some of the work you've done? Yeah, so we, I mean, so we, we are a global company. We have customers everywhere and G G GDPR hit us just like hit everybody else um, and you know, we had to go through the whole thing of inventory and what we like, and we had been doing a lot of that beforehand anyway, because dealing with like the really sensitive information that companies have, like vulnerabilities and assets and things like that, we are, we already cared a lot about making sure that stuff was okay. But like things like users accessing this cloud service via a web portal, that's capturing user information that GDPR cares about now more. And I mean, Cal the. There's California's got similar privacy laws coming on the pack. There's other things happening. We're probably going to see a really similar thing, probably half-ass implemented because that's the way we do things in the U.S. Of, of being able to push some of this in. So we're going to see the similar regime here. Um, and so I think it was great that it like woke people up. I think it's great that they set some new baselines. Like there's there are usually some nuggets of good in most compliance regimes out there. This is not another PCI. It's got some better things associated with PCI. But I mean. My, like when I when I read through GDPR and, and I, I did it because I don't actually have a life and I took I mean things hit me that maybe didn't hit other people when they read it and I thought well okay so if I don't conform to GDPR you're going to nail me for four percent of my annual revenue that's great so as an attacker I'm going to hold you hostage for two percent of your annual revenue when I steal your data then you can just pay me and I won't tell them that you did this right so there's a whole it opens up a whole other slew I think of a tax against companies than it is probably going to help individual user data. Because like all I can tell you is for what, three weeks after that, when that May 25th date or whatever hit, I had to click on so many stupid, yes, I accept your stupid cookies things. Like it was terrible. And everyone's clicked through those as well too. It accomplished nothing. It, 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 and it also froze new, like uh, information being delivered to EU citizens, right? How, there's a ton of news sites that are even to this day still not open to the, to the EU because they don't want to deal with all that stuff. They're not capable of it. They don't have the time, they don't have the money, they don't have the resources. So they don't want, they just, we don't, we just won't cater to you anymore. And like, that's fine. And there's a business model associated with maybe other people can take their place. But I think it's actually caused a lot of interesting other bad issues as it has with the other good issues. And there are a lot of great issues, right? There's, we all have, we'll probably have better privacy in the long run. Our data will probably be a little bit safer in the long run. Um, I still don't put it past companies to have one set of books for the GDPR people investigating things and one set of books for the other ones like they do with every other compliance regime that's out there, even PCI. Um, so you'll probably see that happen. Uh, like it, it, it will be a thing. It, it is a thing. I'm sure it is at the larger companies as well, too. And I don't think it's any surprise that they went to Google first. You know, was it a week after GDPR? Hey, Google, here's, here's the thing for you. We're going to do that. So I, I question the overall motives of GDPR. I think the underlying idea is a great one, and I think making some kind of compliance around it was great, but this is doing a lot of stuff that's going to cause a lot of problems and a lot of chaos. Well, I'm not, we, we didn't go this before, so I'm not sure if you know the answer offhand. Is the sort of data that you, the computer data you collect, all the internet scans, is that actually covered under GDPR? Oh, that's a lovely question, because um, we actually did have many, many weeks of conversations about that particular data. So, for, for like, I'll, I'll talk about two of those things. So, we don't just have computer scan data; we have honeypot data. Um, honeypot data, we don't. That, that's not data from attackers only. A lot of people think, you know, well, everyone's got opinions about about honeypots. Um, and some half good, half bad, maybe people don't care about them. 
Um, what you may not realize is that like so the whole nature behind it is I'm sitting out there, I'm probably not advertising what I am. I don't, I'm just sitting on an IP address, hanging out there, advertising a few services. In theory, no one should talk to me. That's kind of the whole thing. So if someone does, that's really interesting. Um, we, we catch a lot of opportunistic attackers. We, to, we do catch some targeted attacks. We catch some adversaries that are, that are actually trying to scan to collect new inventory because there's lots of really, really, uh, um, what's the word I want to use? Uh, well-resourced um, and well-run groups that regularly scan for and maintain an inventory of things that they want to do, like amplification DDoS things on a regular basis. But we catch a lot of things like API calls. To, it's like, as an example, like we put a lot of our stuff in the cloud. We catch a lot of API calls to AWS infrastructure that isn't there anymore with passwords in it. We, we catch a lot of people trying to go to web pages that don't exist anymore, but they're, their back end is pushing stuff into there and we're seeing stuff on there. So we, we collect a lot of weird data in that places as well, in those places as well, and we collect the whole data. And on the scan side, sure, we do scan things that are out there. We, we, do, we do capture, so one, one of the things that we, the one reason why we aren't subject to it on the scan side is, uh, unlike a lot of other really skeezy internet scanning folks out there, we don't do anything to try to exploit vulnerabilities. We do not send credentials. We will not go against the service that we know could potentially give us back like any kind of real data associated with those things. And like we don't do like stupid, you know, like trick trick mining of S3 buckets because we can't, like it's just kind of silly. Um, it, yeah, it's a thing, it's out there, you don't need to constantly keep getting the press to do it. So we try to not have that problem by actually deliberately, de deliberately scanning for what we scan, the way we scan it, and that, that gets us out of a lot of those regulations. Right, and it sounds like even with all the avoidance, you're still capturing at We least are still capturing things, yes. You probably yeah. don't want. Which, which is also one reason why we don't make the honeypot payload data available to anybody else, because we don't know what that would do to anyone else's liability for those things. Um, and we tend to have machines look at that data versus humans look at that data, um, unless we can figure out that it is like something like a new Mirai variant that's just going out there to run attack data or something like that. Like, so yeah, we, we try our best to, to not collect, and we do regularly purge the information too, that, that we don't need that for a while. That's interesting. That's interesting. So one of the things I was going to follow up on that is I know a lot of the data you have, you mentioned earlier, the, the open data sets. Yep. Um, and you know, you, I think you have a whole lot of stuff out there now from what I understand. Yeah, so we used to be on um, a, uh, we, we used to partner with the University of Michigan uh, with a couple of the grad students that were part of a program there um, that was scans.io. They, they were doing scans, we were doing scans, a couple other folks were doing scans. We all kind of collectively pushed our stuff there. Free repository, go grab your stuff, ha have, have fun. Uh, they got their PhDs and created a startup. So that's not a thing because the University of Michigan doesn't care about that anymore. So um, we had to go figure out a way to get our data out there because we want to give our data away. Um, we, we, we want you to have our data. So if you go to opendata.rapid7.com, it's pretty much, I mean, all but a few of the scan data that's out there. It's a, pretty much all the regular scan data. Like I would do one-off scans and I'll have folks ask, I'll ask folks to write some stuff to do one-off scans that won't, you guys won't care about. Or you might, you can ask me for them and we'll give them to you. Um, but we put all of this stuff out there so that there's a there's the ability for folks to use that to defend things better. Uh, we like the new method of that we've got it out because before we didn't know who was grabbing what and using it for. Uh, and when we did finally get some information about like the numbers of downloads and where they were coming from, there was a lot from you know a giant country that's o o over that makes a lot of pro uh, technology products for the world. Um, but the now we have the ability to get folks registered so we know who it is at least, uh, at least to a certain degree who it is. Um, and we can accept or reject the, the open data access request based upon that. We know what's being downloaded, when it's being downloaded. Uh, we've also found out that there's a lot of really awesome people doing a lot of really awesome research uh, with the data sets, especially our DNS data sets. Um, honestly, if, if you are doing anything in cybersecurity and you're not using our DNS data, seriously, sign up for an account. Um, because we pretty much do all the, all the hard work of doing DNS lookups for you and it's all the forward and reverses of everything we get on a regular basis of all the, of all the DNS names that we collect. So it's millions and millions and millions of records. And um, we keep it fresh and it's updated on a regular basis and it's, it's on our dime, so go for it. Um, it's, and we, there's a lot of uh, companies, uh, startup companies that are using that data to help defenders find things faster, to, you know, stop, stop spamming fast. Like there's, it's, it's been really cool seeing the help that this is for like the aid this has caused to the defender community. Can you just briefly talk about how, how you would use the data to, to find something like that? To find uh, yes, like for the DNS data, um, so if you don't use our DNS data as an example, you have to go through a lot of hoops of collecting 
a lot of data from some resource, usually paying for it from providers that actually have that data. So let's say you're a defender within an organization. Let's say you're not like just doing machine learning as part of a vendor thing, but you're actually a defender in an organization. And you want to get, you want to do, has anyone registered spam lookalikes for me? Because uh, I got to tell you, all of the services that I've seen that claim they do that, and I've been, I've worked in large, large companies where I've used those services, and up, that, that's up until five years ago, they really sucked at it. Um, so I think you could probably create a pretty good machine learning algorithm to look for, you know, near spam domains for what you've kind of got out there to be able to detect. You know, are we seeing a spin above these things? So ours isn't real time. We do it like we we only scan a couple of times. We only do the DNS resolutions a couple of times a month. Uh, but you're at least going to know within a much shorter period of time than not knowing at all uh, of taking that data. And the beautiful thing about it, talking about our infrastructure at scale and you know, infrastructure as code, it's on AWS, it's on AWS. So it's literally you can just spin it over to S3, bring it up there, and start working at it in Athena or in EMR or whoever you want to kind of do those things without a whole lot of effort on your part to kind of do that. That's interesting. I wasn't even aware of that. I guess you have a lot of other academic groups as well as commercial take take advantage of this sort of. Yeah, sort yeah, of yes, we do. As, as a matter of fact, oh, I can't talk about this. Is, is, are, we, are we being broadcast anywhere? We're not being broadcast. Yeah, I'm sure someone's going to tweet this, but you, if actually, if you actually, I think I tweeted it out, so I might be all right to do it. Um, I, I did it late at night, so no one saw it. But we are we're actually not only in opendata.rapid7.com, but we're now one of the official Amazon public data sets as well, too. So we're pushing our DNS data in the Amazon public data sets category, too. And we're going to be pushing a lot more there as well. They're, they're doing a whole rollout campaign for it, but I can't stop tweeting, so I actually mistweeted it. So I, I think I'm okay saying it live here. So Coming to a Kaggle competition near you. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, no, seriously, because like the more folks can find inside there, um, the better off it is. Uh, you, you hold a position which I think most people aren't familiar with, and some people in the industry might be really jealous of, uh, called chief data scientist. Um, so when an organization sets up a chief role, that usually means this is part of the overall guiding principle of the organization. And it's interesting to see cybersecurity a cybersecurity company taking that and saying, this yeah, but is you have to. It's like, yeah. So this is the thing, right? It's not. I mean, and even if so I, I don't like sit in board meetings. I, I couldn't. I, I am more than I'm not going to have more teams. <laughs> um, but the if, if there's if there isn't a person or a group of people or a department, if, and I don't care what size company you are, you could be like three people. One of them needs to be focusing on this. It, knowing what you're doing and where your data is and how you're using that data and how you need to bring all that data together. And who's duplicating data and who's duplicating? Like, if you don't have someone focusing on that data strategy, because I, I don't mean, I try to just look at internet data all day, but I'm not allowed to just do that, right? I have to look, care about other things and talk to other departments and kind of do a lot of other stuff too. And it's like knowing where the data is, knowing how you're going to work with it, you know, creating anonymization pipelines so that you can actually do data science on stuff without having customer, actual customer, customer information on things. Um, like basically understanding all that there is in your organization about data so you can do better things with that data and not screw that data up and secure that data better and not leak it and not have privacy problems with that data. Like that's a really, really, really important role. So like there's like that, that role I think is something that if you don't have it in your organization, petition for it, maybe be that person that since you, you're here, you care about data, you have to care about data here. Um, and and that, that's just going to get more, I mean, you've got things like GDPR forcing that's it. Like they've got a forced role right now, at least in the EU, that you need to have that role. I mean, you can outsource it to a third party if you want to. That's kind of crazy because it's your data. Um, but to understand what data you have, what you're doing with it, how you're securing all this, like that's that's actually a defined role that they want. That's one of the good things in it. Um, I hope it, I hope it's not just a yet another executive position like CISOs used to be, where there was a checkbox position. You just put someone in there. They might have been in finance. It's gotten a lot better now, and I hope that we start off better with like chief data officers or chief you know chief data scientists. Versus that, because I think it makes a lot more sense to do something like that. How much? I'm just curious. And this this is more to Rapid Seven than, than broadly. But how much evangelizing are you doing internally about? Hey guys, you need to care about this. Yeah. So it's myself and there's another person, um, John Wallman, in the, in the organization. Um, and John does a lot of the day to day le like work for, for this particular thing, where he is. I think, I mean, and I say love work, I mean, I mean like jet lag work. He flies to all of our offices, meets physically in person with the people, uh, tries to, from the ground swell up, get them to understand the need to have common schemas, to not duplicate efforts, to bring stuff together, to allow access to things. Um, and, and actually, I think that's the other thing about this too, is like, you know, we have probably one of the toughest security teams on the planet, like they say no first and then it's like no let's have a conversation it's like can we have no let's have a conversation is what they want to do with that and then we have to talk about what we want to do with things how we want to do things where we want to store things what field do you want to access like no, you can have a b and not c through z 
Um, it's because like they're really good gatekeepers because they they understand where the stuff is and do that too. So I think there's lots of pockets throughout the thing that actually play a role in being able to do something like that. So I, I just know that from, from the role that I hold now, the role that I've held in previous organizations, it's having someone who's, who's responsibility. I'm glad to get this to you. Having someone whose responsibility is you all have to appreciate how important this is. This is if we don't use the data we have, if we don't consider how to take advantage of it. It's our own loss. This is a resource we have available to us. Yeah, I mean, it, and it's, it's actually a little more than that too. A lot of it is, okay, so we're gonna, so we, have, we if you go to our Get, Rap, Rapid Seven's got a great public uh, public open source GitHub. It isn't just Metasploit. Um, and, yeah, everyone thinks it just, but it isn't just Metasploit. And um, one of our cooler things that we put there, I mean, it's in Ruby, so like I, I mean, I mentioned that as language I have to use. I have to use that sometimes. Um, but there's a there's a library there called Recog. And what that is, it's a library of XML um, fingerprints and also a tool to actually do fingerprinting of banners and things that you get to be able to do it. It's really useful and go for it, use it. Like the, the thing, contribute more fingerprints. We're trying to do our best to put them in there too. Um, but there's a great conversation to have there. It's like, do we keep investing in creating those fingerprints or do we potentially like, do we, so can we sum up the cost of maintaining those fingerprints ourselves because the community doesn't really contribute a lot to it, mostly because no one knows about it. Um, or do we look at using a third party that does it? That's basically dedicated to creating, maintaining a fingerprint database so that we can have better fingerprints for the stuff that we really want. Like, you know, where? So that 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 that's a real big thing. Like, actually costing out, you know, providing the model of saying what that is, so that you can have a better discussion with the teams. Like, maybe we shouldn't do this ourselves. And some people like are passionate about that tool and they love that tool. And may, maybe we shouldn't use that tool anymore. So there's lots of discussions that data has around. Like, it's not just what data you have. It's like. Should we do something different? Should we use other people's data? Should we? Yeah, exactly. Just yeah. emphasizing that if you're, if someone like you is not in that role, yeah, then that your your voice is simply just not part of the conversation. Oh, exactly. Yeah, and it's being made by CFO or whoever has, some or, or or just not being made. Yeah, exactly. Or being made by some individual team that you know can justify and kind of do it. Right. right. I mean, I guess just make sure that when you're doing this stuff, someone's got to be doing this conversation. So to, to back to to your to your kind of how you run this role. When you're trying to bring on a new a new data scientist to the team, someone's going to do analysis. Kind of, how, how do you look towards hiring? What, what are you looking for in an individual? Uh, so we don't look for any cybersecurity experience. Um, I I don't need a cybersecurity person on the team. I have like a couple hundred people in the company that are really good at cybersecurity. Uh, sure, if you have both, that's great. But it's still really hard to find cybersecurity focused data scientists. It's a tough skill set because everyone's everyone's getting them. Like everyone, that that's a pretty great niche right now. If you can do both. Go for it. You're going to make a ton of money in, the, in this thing if you're good at it. Um, but I, I like bringing in folks that have different perspectives in different areas and different have had different business experience. Um, what the first thing, like day one when they come on, and actually I usually end up saying this in the interview just because I over I over talk in interviews. Um, but I say like you know if you, you know when or if you get this job, like you, your job is to tell me when I'm an idiot. Like I'm 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 a 30 plus year person in the industry. I come with 30 years of assumptions. I still try not to have assumptions, but I'm a human, so I have assumptions. I make them and I, I, I embed them into my analyses. And you need to tell me, like, you need to ask me why. And then if I don't give you a good answer, you need to tell me I'm an idiot. And you need to, we need to figure out a better thing. So I want someone that doesn't know things so they can ask and ask and ask and ask and ask. And then, oh, you're right. I was an, and it happens. Like, I've been told I'm an idiot about 12 times now. So um, you would, I know, I know you think it's more, but it's, it's about 12. Um, <laughs> And uh, so I, I like having that perspective because honestly, I, I can teach uh, anybody that's got the curiosity gene. I can teach cyber too. I mean, any if you've got the, and if you're a data scientist, you, you're either a really bad one if you don't have the curiosity gene, or you or you just got the job because you went to a thing. But if you have the curiosity gene, I can turn you into one of the best cybersecurity people on the planet. And, and kind of taking that out a little bit, I think one thing which is kind of hiding under that is the ability. You know, it, it's one thing to say you're an idiot. That's not very helpful. To be able to explain yes. why it is, I think, and then actually convince you successfully, I think is a skill. I mean, no one's ever said those words to me directly, but like they've they've challenged my assumptions and, and very explicitly given me like this is why. Yes, yeah, so yeah. right. I know. I know. When we hire up, one of the biggest things we look for is someone comes on and gives an interview about anything. We've had people talk about atmospheric science. It's someone talk about planetary gravitational something or other. You know, somebody talk about microbiology, but it's. Can they explain and convince me of some concept? Yeah, and and the data science team isn't solely uh, cybersecurity focused. I mean, I guess I, mean, I say that, and, but I, every single thing we do in the company relates to cybersecurity some way, at least down the road to our customers. So I guess it's hard to say they aren't. But we'll we'll have someone as part of a project that's working on a customer attrition rates versus not. I mean, and you say, why would you have one of your data scientists and your cybersecurity team work? 
well, if we have a customers being attrition, it's because there's something wrong somewhere, right? Generally, like unless they got like a better steak dinner from another, another vendor, like it's generally something that's not wrong with that's not, that's not good with our product. So we want to know what that is. So we should have some really smart people. And I find that people who have studied other things besides cyber and doing data science are probably better at that than doing something. So being able to work with other teams and doing some of that stuff is actually pretty cool. On the flip side, um, doing that in product level embedding and not necessarily doing like working with like hex strings like cyber and doing it on the front end. So like, you know, looking at the customer uh, trials that we do and seeing like what leads people to do, like to take it, to go from trial to be an actual customer. And then being able to say, hey, if we can streamline that in the product, let's figure out what we can make them use the product better for. And we can also look at the product itself and see what features of the different, because just like every other vendor, we've got tools with a billion features that no one knows how to use, right? So like if we can figure out where people are using things and not using things, and look across the customers and see customers that do these kinds of things have fewer overall incidents if we have a full package with them, we can then suggest to other companies, if you were to use the tool better in these you So like basically being able to apply like some of the traditional marketing level things, traditional product level things, but also to use that to analyze the product usage and do this stuff and bring it back in, that's gonna make the cybersecurity functions in those organizations that are using the tool a lot better as well too. So it's more of a holistic view of cybersecurity data science than just extra. Tend to be allowed to describe things. When you, when you bring someone in from, from start, how long until you find they're actually already able to provide value, given that you have to train them on the whole cyber side? Um, so you actually, um, wow, so that's like, so humans are different, so like, I, I won't even begin to do a kind of a distribution because it's probably like, you know, some log, log tail thing. But um, I can give a couple examples of some of the ones that we've actually brought in. Uh, so I've, we, we had one a few years ago, I won't mention names of people. Um, I, I can tell you who they are later, but I just won't do the public thing. Um, They'll probably tell you because they probably blogged about it or, or tweeted about it. But um, they knew computer stuff, just not cyber stuff. And they went from coming on board to writing a machine learning driven web shell, PHP web shell detector that does that actually did a really cool job. That's not open source, sorry. Um, that that um, within a month of being on board. Wow. Yes. That's pretty, that's pretty good. Um, other so other things like if we're going to be doing something like hey, we're going to ingest a bunch of NetFlow and try to detect XYZ. I can't tell you what XYZ is. Um, that then goes into here's a packet, here's what flows are. Like that's, there's a whole bunch of like education and reading that actually got to go on there. So that's like depending on like the level of, of what that actually means, it, it can be pretty big. Um, okay. But on the flip side, like, like you, you can get to, one of the things I like to get people up to speed on when they come in is doing the internet scale data, A, because it's just wicked fun. But it, you can do a lot of traditional techniques, and like for like the, the honeypot data, like every classic time series thing works. Like it, the, it works really, really well. Um, I don't like to use the words anomaly detection because that just has a lot of bad connotations with it. But you can do like this is what the service has been. This is what we forecast to be. We can we can see things out there. So like you know we we've had people you know contribute to the early warning system that we have like you know first week that they've been up for. That's pretty good. And I guess yeah. that also kind of so earlier it speaks to the ability to tool up, get up to speed, go fast. And, even though it's a data set they're not familiar with, it's the environment they're not familiar with, it's it's, it's I mean, close yeah. I mean, if you if you can document your data science projects well, if you can have the code structure really well, you can have the deployment, all kinds of things set up, and then you know you basically have all the features defined and explained really well, and then anyone coming on board is just treating like another data science problem with different kinds of data potentially as inputs, diagnosing and triaging what didn't work. Um, I think one of the hardest things that we have is the feedback loop, and I think that that's a challenge everywhere. Being able to take human feedback and when something isn't working or being able to apply feedback from like a large scale system like our, like our early warning system so that they can be better at what it does later on down the road. Um, we tend to not have the time, money or resources to invest in that as much as we would like to. I think that's a general problem like in, in this space right now. I'm curious, one thing which we've actually been talking about a lot internally, um, there's a standard software development life cycle, which you know, we were talking about Puppet and all the fun tools that come along with that and all yeah. the testing and all that. Do you have a, a is, is this tool chain and then the process you use for machine learning style script or analyses, is that pretty similar to the standard? Did you actually do something different? So we, um, and I think we follow a model, I mean, it's customized obviously because we're a different company, but a lot of DS teams are organized in the same sprint agile model that's out there. So if we're going to be going after a particular problem, it, and I hate I hate all this terminology, but it's just epic, right? That you're going to create, and there, then then there, there's a bunch of like little th the things you do between those things, and like the 
being able to bucket those things and say, in these two weeks, we're going to get this accomplished and we're going to report out on this thing. That might, that might be a model tuning thing and the output of it isn't really cool looking or nothing or anything, but it's got, it's got a really good thing. Or it might be two weeks and we're going to investigate this thing and after two weeks, we're not going to get on this path anymore and we can scrap the whole thing. So trying to bucket things up into those like little two-week sprints underneath an epic for a particular thing helps us to make fail fast and to make better decisions what we're going to do and to also have have something to show for our efforts because we have to show it to ourselves and then every month we have to show it to the rest of the company so because we're basically demoing stuff all the time to make sure that we're all you know doing stuff and getting it. so i think having that little bit of incentive to kind of go do that is pretty cool and the thing is those sprints aren't necessarily all product or feature focused like those sprints might be i'm going to go play with heisenberg data for two weeks um, and I thought that's our Heisenberg is our honey network. Like well, I'm going to play with that data for two weeks to see, what I can, see if I can find something cool and create something from that to be able to do that. And this is, it, it gives you that structure yeah. to be able to work with it. So you know, we're getting a little bit closer to, to, to where I want to open this up to, to the audience here. But um, if you had one thing you could say to, the, to everyone here about, you know, just when, when volumes come out, you should be paying attention, responding. There's some, there's a couple, you know, here, here, here's the process that we go through to find this. And in order for something useful to happen after it's found, you need to do a step as well. Is there is there something you want to you want to share on that on that note? Um, so I guess what I'll say for and like maybe say, but also just communicate from the evidence for the past six months of this year. Just spent the, like actually the past couple of weeks like looking back at the past past, past six months of the year. Um, the attackers have gotten smarter, and like I know like duh, right everyone gets smart. The, the attackers have got like we're talking like the run of the mill. Like two guys in a back room, attackers have gotten smarter. They they are taking advantage of the at scale resources either provided by the cloud or by a bunch of IP cameras that have been pwned, right? Um, like like so, I mean, they have their own set of like they have a like this IoT infrastructure that's out there. There's like seven million devices that are running pretty seriously decent AMD or Intel chips that can do a lot of really good damage and or have a lot of compute power, and they're regularly used for some of these things as well too. So the attackers, from what we've seen all over, I mean, from the opportunistic campaign-oriented ones that are actually organizations with structure and CISOs, like CEOs and things like that, to the, to the couple of folks in the back room, they have gotten smarter. Um, they are thinking ahead to the next level of the tactics that they're going to apply. I mean, they quickly pivoted from ransomware to crypto mining because they realized that their, the whole ransomware was fraught with peril. They've got to have help desks. Um, they've got to interact with users, like actual on the phone and stuff. Like, so like, they realized that that wasn't a great business. But some of them still do that. Um, and it's a just like they target things better and like they're really smart by targeting like smaller US towns and communities that don't have resources to kind of go and fix things as well. But so th they're, they're thinking outside the box. They're doing things like I'm not going to take over the micro ticks to make them mine. I'm going to install things that make everybody mine for me, right? So I, I have seen, and I've been doing this for a long time and like this, like, like literally 30 years and this is I have not seen this level of sophistication, this level of understanding complexity, this level of orchestration, this level of administration, um, this level of forward thinking and out of the box thinking. Like I, I have not like the like I think it was the adaptive attack report said too. I have not seen that before like the January of this year. One more example around that, just kind of one quick cube attempt. Like like they were smart enough to go after and the the Android um, de debugger bus, right? So like, there's a service that Android devices can run. That people can like load load their own software onto it usually usually for software development they were smart enough to go look for that before any of us were looking at them looking for that who cared about port 555 and that weird protocol they used before no no one did they were smart enough to go do that and do that to mine cryptocurrency so because they've shifted their way of revenue generation because they've shifted what they're thinking it's so i i guess what i would say to you isn't so much like when the new bone comes out like what should you do like what like do you actually have a risk management group that has one of their charters is thinking like an attacker and creating these scenarios that you then have to run against your company and how you'd actually respond to this thing because i was also talking to a bunch of insurance agencies the other day and they were like yeah if we find out that you have like if you, if you got a policy with us and we find out that you had a crypto miner infection because they can find that out um they've got sources for that your policy is going to go up three times. Like they're actually getting because you had no control over your infrastructure. They managed to get in. Sure, they didn't steal data, but they ate up your electricity and they took over an advantage. So, so I was I would tell you is think like an attacker. Have a group that's responsible for that. And you really, in, in terms of the bone thing, at this point, you only have about two days um, for any really serious RCE bug or privilege escalation to make it into a toolkit to be able to go use. So not not that you can patch in two days. No one can do that. And I would I would I would never tell you to hurry up and patch in two days. I used to have to deal with that at a large enterprise, so I, I feel your pain. 
Um, but I would tell you that you really have to, like, you have to know what's on your network, and you have to be able to assess what the risk of the things are and have a way of prioritizing the patching of those things because you just don't have the time to do that. And also, attackers are using their same techniques they used on the internet internally now. So, you know, struts on the internet, that's so old because these things have been out there for all. There's like a couple million uh, SMB systems on the internet. They, like, not pet yet, got inside. Um, so, every, like, your, your squishy intermittal is still squishy intermittal, and everything that they're honing their attacks on the outside for, they're just bringing internally. And that's what I was saying before about GDPR. Like, I, I, I mean, we'll probably not hear about it unless some whistleblower, you know, you know blows their whistle. But I totally believe we're going to see ransomware targeted against, you know, GDPR responsible organizations and ransoming them for 2% of their revenue versus 4% of their revenue. And that, that's going to be a thing. We'll probably see it leak from somewhere to be able to do a thing. So you need to think about how these all things play out because it's all attackers are doing is figuring out the least amount of work they have to do to make the most amount of money that they want to make. And that's, then, that's just that one segment of attackers. Down the road, and we talked about this last year, but down the road you have the other problem of attackers who are like, uh, groups like, and I'll, like, I'll use Al-Qaeda as an example, and I'm not just using it as a scare tactic, but you know, they've got a level of sophistication that's going to rise at some point when they realize there's all this junk connected to the internet that they could take advantage of to wreak destruction from a, a long way away without actually blowing anything up with actual like, you know, explosives. Once they figure that out, it's we're, we're not ready for it. I can I, I get because I get all the devices and all my honeybots every single day. I can, you can show I'll show you the data. So I think there's other things we have to worry about down the road. But for your organization right now, you need to be thinking about those things and like really prior, like knowing like just knowing what's on your network is probably the biggest thing versus the patching thing because you can't patch what you don't know. Thank you. Uh, let's open it up. If there's any questions, you can take if take some questions at this point. You can challenge my R thing if you want. <laughs> Yeah, so the, so there are there are people think, thinking about those problems. Um, the we have an entire group um, at Rapid Seven in the research division mostly that's focused on Internet of Things. I mean, also in a, in planes, trains, and automobiles, the transportation level security, and um, trying to not only just you know versus just quantifying what the issues are, finding a vuln because honestly, it's not that hard to find vulns. Like vuln researchers are going to yell at me; they always yell at me, so I don't go to that kind anymore. Um, but like the, it's not that, it, like, it's easy to break things. It's not hard to. It's not. It's not easy to, to actually secure things and make them usable, right? So that the whole usable security is is, is a model where we, what we're trying to do is a, take some of the folks that we have in our user experience department, or I, I get the, the it's UX is the short two letter word for that these days, um, and have them thinking out of the box both for web stuff because we need that there too, but and like the, how would you deal with something like that? And how would you secure something like a pacemaker associated with that? Um, there, there are lots of physical things you can do to those, but a lot of that r removes the ubiquitousness of the devices. Like ba basically, security creates an impediment without. So if you have nothing around that gives you the ability to, you know, do what you need to do without that that huge impediment, we're still going to see things like really open systems in planes, trains, and automobiles in in people in people's bodies that are out there. Uh, I think one one of the cool things that's happening out there, you've got groups like I am the Cal Cal Calvary, who will um, Calvary who will work and you know, basically create models who will actually have working groups that will be, be brought into organizations that will you know basically create evangelists inside organizations like device make manufacturers who can make sure that people are aware of what these problems are and that will get the smart people inside those organizations thinking about how to solve those things. I, I think a lot of it is just there's awareness um, and there's a, a level of training that needs to happen and a lot of level, 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 level education. But it is a real concern. It isn't just a concern like inside your body. It, like, there's a level of concern. like and, like. If you travel, like any train, I was going to actually say a particular train person, but um, you, know, you, you could pay, pretty much get access to virtually the inner workings of it without a whole lot of effort. On most trains, you kind of work, you kind of go to right now. And like for cars, like the, 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 this whole autonomous car movement or just smart cars that you've got stuff interface into there too. Um, the car manufacturers, because of work, uh, 
uh, for for the past couple of years. They've gotten a lot smarter in how to do things. So I think just raising the level of awareness, raising the level, and just get, letting them have the opportunity to focus on that is where we need to go. But I, I don't have the solution for it, but I think there's a lot of smart people that can make that an easier problem to solve in all the long term. And I know that we've been having, there's, there's been a lot of focus on just software development. Um, I know that at the SEI, there's a whole group that just looks at what they call threat modeling. Which is for what, you know, whatever it is I'm making, how will someone attack it? And the question isn't, will someone attack it? That's, that, that's, that's ground level. Someone's going to attack it. Whatever you make, unless you're making it for yourself, you never do anything. It's going to be attacked. So now how do you think about it? And then to your point, whatever the attack is, how do I prevent it in a way that's not going to you know, cause a problem for the person who's using it? Uh, and it, it's an entire field, exactly as you're saying. A lot of training, a lot of evangelizing. Is making people aware of it. Wow. So, um, so I, I don't deal with it on the software side for us, like because I, I don't work in the infosec group. As so, so I don't know what they actually use to take our products and actually do like threat model against the products. But I can tell you. Uh, what I used to try to do back, back in the day when I ran like a risk group at a large organization is that we would um, so we would use FAIR as the modeling framework to be able to do something. So if you're not worth uh, factor analysis of information risk, if anyone doesn't know, you can look it up. Uh, Jack Jones is amazing, really good stuff there, and um, that gives you a really solid framework to do like quantitative or qualitative analysis of, of a given scenario. Um, but I think what you need is like basically smart like red teamers to have an understanding of what scenarios are so they can give you scenarios to do modeling of but then I think you also need to show folks like in actual real, real world terms from a red team what some of the worst ones actually do look like yes like here's here's a bunch of stuff that we like you basically know what's out there you know what stuff you have you know what the assets are you know what the data is blah 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 you create whatever it is that the attack you create the scenario for the attacker you model that you go through you show the impact and then like if for the ones that are really high impact you take that and you actually do it with your own team to actually go do it or you hire someone to come do it so you can prove to because a lot of times like it, it feels like every organization's minnesota like you gotta show them so like the the reality is i think you have to do that and then take that and kind of, so I, there's not one there's not one methodology for creating the threats though like you really have to think about that and understand it on your own like I'm, and and that's not the software development side of things that's just more of a process or an already established application or an already established infrastructure kind of thing Uh, so number one, and actually the, 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 this is kind of cool because we we actually get slave labor for this particular time too. Um, so for, so so they, the, the, you know, when they come on board, they have already gotten all the access to all the systems that they need or whatever. We've already established that, and then like they're told like after and then after all of like the two days of mandatory like regulatory based training things they have to do, um, and they actually could be a productive human being back in society. Uh, here, here is the wiki that we've got. I hate that term, but here's the wiki that we've got established. Here's the doc in Confluence or whatever that documents everything that we have in the data science department, how we do things, blah, blah, blah. It's, a, it's a huge document, like it's multiple, multiple pages. And you're, you're, you're assigned until the next new hire, um, hopefully that's a good time span, sometimes we hire fast, so maybe it's not. Uh, your job until the next new hire is to basically correct all the mistakes in it, like anything that's changed, anything that we've updated, anything that was just wrong or, or whatever. So basically they are now the curators of the document of the knowledge of how we do things in the organization. Uh, that's proved to be really, really great because, like, that way they any pain they felt they've documented and they've fixed, fixed or corrected, or we've corrected so it's not a thing anymore. So, so, so I think that's if you maintain that body of knowledge about what you have, where it is, blah blah, blah like all your data, all your processes, like that's got to be a solid set of documentation that keeps like the reference point for everyone that can go do it. It's just it's just great to be able to do that. Um, on top of that, if there's a cybersecurity gap that we need, like, so if there's gonna be, like, they're going to come on, they're going to do a particular project, like it may involve networking things. We will actually probably do a special training session, maybe not with us, maybe we'll be with a third party to go get up to speed in that particular set of, of data that's out there. If they're not familiar with network level data or web server data or whatever it is out there, um, to get them immersed in something to do with that. A lot of times though, the people that we, we've brought on have been self-starters enough that like, here is a bunch of resources. 
go read for two weeks or four weeks or whatever the time is going to be to go do that. Um, basically give them an opportunity to become experts in that, to talk to them. I mean, we are the Metasploit company, so anything hacking-wise, we've got some of the best folks to kind of go do that. We, we're also a software development company, and we also have a great security team, so they can go talk to them about stuff. So really giving them the opportunity to, to research stuff as well um, in both, in, 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 whether it's formal or informal, how they, however they do things to kind of go do that. So I think with that body of knowledge and making them the curators of it while, while they're there until the next person, uh, I think that, that's, it. that's been a huge, huge win for us to be able to do that. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Thanks.